Let's turn very quickly to the book of Matthew again this morning. We're in chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And we just want to, we'll pull a few, just a few things together uh, before we draw our time this morning to a close. Praise God. Praise God. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to begin to read in verse 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeks that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, He rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Just those few verses and we just trust that the Lord's blessing will be upon his word today for his name's sake. Very, very quickly because we realize we're looking at time and it is Muller's Sunday and I know there's other things perhaps that you have planned and so on. But we have been building since the beginning of the year, thinking about a church that's busy, a church that's active, a church that's involved right across the board with evangelism. And a few weeks ago, we talked about, you know, the work of the ministry being faithful in ministry. We talked about the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And so that's where we're at in all of this that we've been trying to build on since the beginning of the year. Now, Having said all all of that this morning, last Sunday morning we we thought or we moved into the thought of the shepherd and how the shepherd goes to look for the sheep which has gone astray. We we based the ministry on what we read this morning, Matthew 18 and also in Luke chapter 15. And we thought about how the shepherd will leave the 90 and 9 and how he will go after the the one. And we called the message last Sunday morning the importance of one. In fact, it was the importance of one to God. And this morning I want to to counteract that because I want us just very quickly, and we'll run through this as quick as we possibly can, but I want to see is the, the importance of one this morning. We have seen the importance of one to God. I want us to see the importance of one to the devil. The importance of one to the devil. We've seen the shepherd who will go after that one sheep that was lost, the individual. George showed that, one of the slides that he showed this morning uh, was that little child, one that has been rescued. And I said last Sunday morning, it's so often whenever we think of outreach and evangelism, we're thinking of what we can do on a large scale, but it starts and it's always right back down to the individual. It's down to the one. And today I want to continue, as I say, on this line, keeping in mind the value of the one, which the Lord Jesus Christ often emphasized. But the enemy of souls has concentrated his attack on the one as well, on the individual. You can go right back into the book of Genesis in chapter 3. We're not taking the time to look that up this morning. But the Bible tells us there that the enemy of souls, he approached the woman whenever she was on her own. And he came to her and he talked with her and he insinuated and and he directly contradicted the word of God, causing the woman to dethrone God and to enthrone him in her heart and in her life. And we know the story. She together with her husband, Adam, they obeyed the voice of the enemy and they were led into rebellion against God. It came through one, one person. And you can follow that right down through your Bible. Because then, since Adam is the head of the human race, by virtue of the fact that he was the first man, the world is suffering because the enemy first approached the individual and constrained the individual to fall into sin and to rebel against God. For the word says, by one man, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Through the sin of one, men and women, friends, multitudes, right down through the years, became sinners. 
through the attack of the enemy upon the individual. He concentrated upon the individual. And we can run that theme right across the Bible today. You come over into the book of Job, and whenever you get behind all that's happening there with Job, we see exactly what the enemy can do on one life. Whenever he is given leeway, whenever he has the permission to do what he wants to do. And we know in the life of Job, an individual, he lost his possessions, he lost his family, he lost his health. The devil had done absolutely everything that he could do to destroy that life. Of course, within the limits and the boundaries that God had set upon him. But you see in that book exactly what the enemy will do with one life whenever he can get his hands upon it and get his clutches into that life. And he attacked Job in that way. And he tried to strip Job of absolutely everything. He would have stripped him of his life if it hadn't been for the fact that God said, but you will not go beyond that boundary. You will not take his life. But we see what the enemy will do with one life. You move on across your Bible. You come into the book of Zechariah chapter 3. And in that book, you find that the prophet said he saw Joshua, who was the high priest at that time, one man, and he saw him standing before the angel of the Lord. And the prophet Zechariah says, and Satan was standing on his right hand to resist him, resisting the approach of the individual to the presence of Almighty God. We move on. He also attacks the individual hearer. The Lord Jesus Christ told the parable of the sower. Listen to Matthew 13 and 19. Jesus says, when every, anyone hears the word of the kingdom, then comes the wicked one and snatches what was sown in his heart. It's the heart of the individual. You see, friends, the enemy knows the importance of the individual life. The enemy will always seek to attack the individual life. And so he comes to the individual to snatch away even the seed that was sown in that individual's heart. We're moving very quickly. Whenever the father was bringing his boy to Jesus, you know the Mount of Transfiguration? You know, and, and, and Peter says, Lord, let's stay here. Don't we just love to be in the presence of God and so often that's at the expense of the needs of the people that are all around us. And we can come and go from the church building. We can come and go from the times whenever we fellowship together with the Lord. And so often the needs of those in the community all around us, by and large, go untouched. And so Peter says, Lord, let's stay here. No, no. Jesus says, let's get down into the valley. There was a lad in the valley with a tremendous need. And the father brings his son to the Lord Jesus Christ whenever they come down. The other disciples has tried to bring about some kind of deliverance. Hasn't happened. And you see, one of the enemy's evil spirits threw the lad on the ground. And the Bible says, tear him in the very presence of Jesus, the Son of God. He exercised his power, even if just for a moment, by concentrating on that one. And of course we know, praise God, Jesus set that one free and, and delivered him in that situation. It was the devil who put it into the heart of one man, Judas Iscariot, to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, that was in his heart long before the act ever blossomed, so to speak, on the outside. We move on over into the Acts chapter 5. And Peter looks at Ananias. You know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. We sold our possessions. Here's the money. But they hold something back. And Peter said to Ananias in verse 3, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? The devil put it into the heart of one man to try to hoodwink, to try to lie to the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter 5 verse 8, speaking of the devil, tells us he's on the prowl. He tells us he goes about like a roaring lion, lion seeking the one whom he may devour. The enemy knows the importance of one life. He knows the importance of one soul. And I want to tell you today that he concentrates his efforts. The forces of hell concentrate their efforts upon the life of the individual. And here's the thing. He always takes advantage 
of the aloneness. Forgive me, I don't know whether that's a proper word or not. But he always takes the advantage of the aloneness of one person. And then we think fellowship with the people of God is not important. You see, folks, we have no idea how important true fellowship really is. We have no idea what it might mean for someone who's carrying a burden or going through a problem just to be able to sit down and, and, and have a chat. Maybe 10, 15 minutes and just share. You know the old saying, a burden shared, a problem shared is a problem halved. And so often we allow people to go their way. We allow people to go off into their isolation. We allow people to go off into their loneliness. And it's at those times that the person is vulnerable from the attack of the enemy. We think of the emissaries of the devil, the hypocrites, upon whom the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 23 pronounced his woes, the scribes and Pharisees. Listen to this. They realized the importance of one. Because Jesus says to them in verse 15, Matthew 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. They would go to any length to make one proselyte, concentrating their effort, concentrating their energy, concentrating everything that they have on the one that they might make him a proselyte. And the Lord Jesus said, looked at them and he said, you know, you make them twofold more a child of hell than you are yourselves. You see, friends, they know the importance of the one. And I believe God, as we think about the one, the individual, the importance of the one, I believe God wants us to be gripped with the truth of this. How important one soul is to the Lord. The night you were saved, if you're here this morning and you're saved, the night you were saved, you were an individual, isn't that right? That God laid his hand upon and drew to himself. You may have been on your own saved. You may be among, among a company of people in a meeting perhaps who were saved. But nonetheless, it was individual completely to you. Amen. And the devil does exactly the same. His emissaries, they put the greatest possible value on one soul. And the powers of hell are arrayed against one soul. To keep that one soul away from God. To keep that soul tormented day and night. And I want to suggest to you this morning, it would do you good whenever you're reading your Bible and thinking, you know, to keep studying and looking at your Bible, to keep that thought in your head and to study the attacks and to, to study the subtlety and the approach of the, approach of the enemy to the one to the individual. And you see, in the back of that, the question today has to be asked, what individual can you touch? What individual can I touch? The enemy comes to wreck and to ruin and destroy the life of the one. And I believe he wants me, God wants me to emphasize that truth again this morning. That the powers of hell are arrayed against one soul to keep that one from Christ or to keep that one from fellowship with Christ, depending on how they stand. God wants us, folks, to understand the value of one soul more than the 99 that need no place of repentance. You see, if someone's sick, very quickly, let me tie this up. If someone's sick, that person has a problem. There's a physical ailment, maybe pain, whatever it might be. That person has a problem. And we look at a sick person, and probably that's all we'll ever see. That person has that need. And we pray that that person will be healed. We pray that that person will be touched. We pray that God will minister to that need of that sickness, whatever it might be, to set that person free. Do you know what sickness is? You know what sickness is? Sickness is something that the devil uses to cause isolation. Isolation. To get that person alone. That person is maybe confined to bed. That person is maybe confined to their own home. 
And so that person is isolated, cut off from other people. That person, if they're sick enough, will find it very difficult to pray in any kind of a meaningful way. Because whenever you're not well, your attention is focused on that. And while you may be saved, nonetheless, your prayer life takes, bears the toll because of what's happening to you. And the devil uses sickness. It's a means whereby he can isolate the soul spiritually and isolate the soul physically from both those around and also from God. And then, of course, we know what happens, don't we? Depression can set in. Anxiety can set in. A sense of being alone. No one really knows. No one really understands. No one can really help me. Perhaps even a sense of despair. And folks, listen to me. That's what the enemy does. Because he uses that to cause isolation Loneliness, to be alone, on their own. And it makes that person an easy prey for the enemy. Whenever one person is backslidden, let's move to that for a moment. Doesn't Jesus tell us, or James, I beg your pardon, tell us in the closing verses of his book in chapter 5 to go after that person? He says, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, <clears throat> excuse me, and one convert him, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Here's someone James is referring to who goes astray. A man or, or a woman, perhaps. Backsliding, grown cold in heart, getting away from God. And the responsibility to bring him or to bring her back rests upon someone in the assembly. And I want to say this to you today, and I'm going to say this to you lovingly, and I trust that you'll take my heart in this. No one actually ever says it, but people act it. The responsibility of bringing one back rests with the pastor. So many people think that. It rests with the pastor. Pastor, do you know that so-and-so's away? They've been missing for so long. I wonder, I wonder could you go and see them? I wonder, have you ever gone? And you see, we think, we live in days of time when in the church of Jesus Christ, we think that the responsibility of bringing that one back rests with the pastor or with the elders or with some church worker or whoever who's in that kind of position to do that task. But friends, the Bible says nothing about elders and deacons or pastors doing that. Because in that verse, James never mentions the pastor or the elder or the deacon or the church worker. No, no, he mentions one. If someone has gone astray, erring from the truth, one go, one person, one fellow believer, one fellow Christian. It's the fellow Christian's responsibility to have a heart of compassion to seek and to bring that one back. Not to leave it to somebody else. So to see a fellow believer move away from the Lord is to be responsible to run to that person's help. To run to their help. If you see a brother, it says, in another place overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, seek to restore him in the spirit of meekness, meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Never names an elder or a deacon or a pastor there either. Why am I saying that to you this morning? Friends, because listen, this is all part of the work of ministry. I wonder how many people from the body of Christ we have seen get away from God and we've just allowed them to drift into oblivion. And where are they today? Probably not in a church building at all. 
Ask them today about the Lord. They'll maybe say, making some excuse, like, I don't really know whether I believe that anymore or not. Why? Because the church of Jesus Christ was not burdened enough, had not enough love to go after that one and say, look, let us help you. Let us do whatever we can do. Oh no, we'll just leave it to somebody else. I wonder, does the body really care? Now listen, I haven't got the time today, we're finished. I haven't got the time today to go into the whole teaching of James chapter 5. But let me point out the greatness of the triumph that's referred to in that verse of God's word. We didn't take the time to turn to it to read it up. But this is what it says. He that converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. A multitude of sins. That's the triumph that can be experienced. That's the triumph and the victory, praise God, that's available. Whenever you and I get up and decide in our lives to do what the Word of God tells us we should do towards that brother or sister, there can be tremendous triumph. And the church is here to equip the saints of God for the work of ministry. And that work takes on many, many, many different forms. And yet no matter what the goal is, souls being reached, backsliders being restored, or people strengthened in their walk with the Lord, it all rests on the individual. Reaching the individual. Encouraging the individual. And oh, friends, may we never, ever, ever lose sight of that, the importance of one. You see, behind every person who backslides, behind every person who goes astray, let us always keep in mind that it's not the person. The Bible says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not always the person's fault. But the Bible says that we wrestle, Ephesians 6 and verse 12, against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness on high places. And as I've said, the enemy knows how to concentrate their effort on the one that behind the scenes they might work on that life in order to get that life away from God. Persons saved and backslidden, they become no real use to the kingdom of God in that situation. Their witness, their testimony is practically meaningless. Their desire to tell others about Christ has practically gone and the devil wins the day. Or the other person perhaps who, who isn't saved. We know that we live in a world today where there's so many pressures spiritually that are brought to bear upon people in the natural and in the physical. Their time has well gone, but oh, may God help us, folks, to focus upon the truth of this. Well, we're going to pick up on it again next week. But may he help us to focus upon the truth of this. Where does it start? It starts with the one. Who can touch that one? One can touch that one. And on it goes, and on it goes, and on it goes. You know, there's a, a well-worn cliche that says, if everyone who ever got saved had touched one soul in their life to see them saved, the entire world would be saved today. Did you know that? That's the statistic. If everyone won one, everybody today would be saved. But the problem is so many of us fail to testify. So many of us feel in our witness for Christ. So many of us feel because of a lack of passion for the souls of men and women all around us who are going to a lost eternity because the devil is having a field day in the life of the individual. Father, bless your word to our hearts today. Just bless your word to... Lord, may, may, may we... May we sense the challenge. May we sense the urgency. 
And Lord, in our hearts, may we be determined to live well for you, witness well for you, and to touch as many individual lives as we can for you. Because we ask it in Jesus' name, knowing your love for each one. Amen. Amen. Praise God.